if you want to be tough at something, you have to train that specific ability. Doing generally difficult things will help you be more confident, but it doesn't make you more tough at what you're trying to do. It's task specific. If you want to be able to execute in the most critical situations in football, you need to put your athletes in those scenarios and then you need to teach them how to succeed. On today's Coaching Coordinator podcast, I share part one of a clinic done with Eric Quorum, who at the time was the athletic director for athletic performance at William & Mary. He's been on the podcast before as the director of strength and conditioning for the Houston Texans and has a wealth of knowledge. This podcast is going to challenge the way you think, but there's some great stuff in here. And in part one, he's going to give the rationale behind how you set up practice. And this is especially important in getting your team ready for game one. So here's our podcast with Eric Korn. We, I, I think it was, man, I'm, Eric, I'm losing track of, of days now. <laughs> Every day seems it's like the other. It's, uh, it's Groundhog Day. Literally, it is. Yeah, I think it was either the beginning of last week or it could have been the end of the week before where our podcast where we sat down at, in Louisville at National Conference aired. And I know we talked a little bit about this, so I'm excited to see uh, the details of this. As, as you know, you left and I was still there, people sitting down to do the podcast. So I have not seen the whole presentation by you yet. I'm excited for that. I think it's a great topic. Well, thanks. I, I tweaked some of it, but I th we had some really great discussions at the conference, and it was really neat to just when it was when the presentation was over with to just sit there with coaches and then be like, "Yes, this makes sense," or "We've applied this. What do you think about that?" And there's no perfect answer to any of this stuff. There's just having setting up the appropriate framework. I think is the most important thing. Now, I know you were taking notes during your, your and my discussion. I know one of those you wrote down was the adjustment period. Had you been, I know a lot of things happened like right after that, but had you been able to talk to your coaching staff about that? I have not. I thought that was a brilliant idea, though. And that was something that I was going to throw. I mean, our head coach is like such a smart guy. And he, he's, he's, a, he's a, an amazing person to work with. I, you know, I need to. I'm actually going to make a note right now to send that okay. to him. Make a note about the note. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot going on at the conference now. Oh, man, I know. <laughs> I really enjoy – the one thing I enjoy about your conference is that there's really smart people. There's, like, you don't run into egos. Nobody's checking what school you're at. It's just, hey, let's just sit down and talk and – I just found it, it's a very comfortable place to be. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's the, the, the spirit of it is, is just different than anything else I've ever been to as yeah. a football coach. It's, it's not like your regional clinic, it's not like your local clinic, it's not like AFCA. And there's, there's always been that. That's what's been, to me, the most unique thing about it is kind of just that spirit of sharing there that for whatever reason, I don't know, exactly what it is but it seems like guys are just there to help each other kind of like what we're doing here with this virtual summit no question all right well we'll get things started this virtual summit session today is with dr eric quorum who i don't know your exact title strength and conditioning i know is the the general area but what is your exact title at william and mary well, actually, it's Senior Athletic Director for Student Athlete High Performance. So I oversee go. strength conditioning, sports medicine, nutrition, psychology, sports psychology, anything that has to do with the health and well-being of our student athletes. Okay. Yeah. So it's a, it's a pretty broad, broad uh, role. Right. And, and I first met Eric just through audio uh, over the phone. He was on the podcast. In the first year of the podcast, he was with the Houston Texans at the time, and he came on probably uh, right before the season. We were just doing a series on some things to get your players ready and think about during the year, and it was a, a podcast on sleep, and uh, I still put that one out there every fall and, and actually a few times during the year because it's, I guess, one of those things that is undercoached by us 
and, and not thought about enough is the importance of sleep. And you've been on the podcast now a few times and it's always been great to talk with you. I know our viewers here are going to enjoy this one today. As I said, when you and I talked about it on a podcast a, a few weeks ago, I thought it was a tremendous topic and something, again, that coaches, it's going to resonate with you as you hear it. Maybe you haven't thought about some of these kinds of things, but Eric is right on top of it. And, and for what we're doing on the podcast, you could follow <coughs> me at Coach K Grabowski. Eric, I am going to turn it over to you so you can get going here. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Well, first of all, I just want to say I'm humbled to be here to address my peers in this very pivotal time, really, in world history. It's awesome that we're able to get together. I hope this brings some joy to your morning and helps you look at things maybe in a little bit different way. Today, we're going to talk about practice scripting to maximize performance, on-field performance. Before I get started, really, I want to Whenever you discuss a topic that may be challenging to your thinking, just remember that the primary differentiator between those that achieve exceptional results and those that are average is thinking and decision making. And so I thought this quote was really key. The lonely road to greatness is better than the crowded road to mediocrity. So don't be afraid to, to think in a different way, to challenge your thinking, to ta challenge status quo because really that's the only thing that leads to changes. The objective this morning is we wanna create the right framework to solve our problem. We're gonna determine what practice really is. We're gonna utilize practice scripting, how we utilize practice scripting to enhance skill acquisition, stress inoculation, and game specific fitness. Uh, we're gonna talk about how to utilize training load to enhance performance and to mitigate against injury. We're gonna talk about designing a training camp plan. The first thing we want to do, though, is I want to set the framework. I've really dug into this topic as of recently of mental models. I highly recommend that everybody purchase this book. A mental model simply just describes the way something works. And we all use mental models. They actually just kind of sit below the surface in our brain. And it's how you solve problems, how you predict an outcome. But you have to have the right mental model to solve the problem. And so what I want us to do today is, is I'm going to kind of create a model for you for how to look at what practice scripting is really doing. You're probably thinking to yourself, what are we talking about risk for? Well, I want to read you a quote. My director of athletics performance, Keir Wynnum Flat, uh, put this out recently. He says, all training decisions are a question of risk versus reward. Some riskier methods offer the highest rewards. The nuance of coaching lies in being able to maximize the ratio between the two. The safest method of training is sitting on the couch, but don't expect to win doing it. So every day when you design a practice script, you are intentionally or unintentionally assessing risk. If you want to get better, you got to practice a lot. We all know that. But when you do that, there's a higher risk of injury. If you don't want to get injured, you don't practice. And then guess what? You stink at your sport. So as Howard Mark says, he was the creator of Oak Tree Capital. And general risk is the probability of bad outcomes. Peter Bernstein, who's an economic philosopher, says risk exists because the future is a range of possibilities. This means that more things can happen than will happen. And the future is an uncertain. And sometimes we don't even know what that range is. So for instance, when you watch film of your opponent, you, you're anticipating based off of what they've shown you, how they're going to line up to certain formations, how they may roll coverage, and so that you create a plan. You are assessing risk. And there's two types of risk. The probability of loss, or in our situation, losing, and the probability of gains that you could potentially miss out on. And I think this is really important to notice, is that when you look at risk, you got to look at what's the downside, but what's the upshot that you could be missing out on. And to get this right, you must have the right probability distribution for the future. So for instance, if you play craps, right, 36 different combinations in craps, the most likely combination is seven. That'll happen six out of 36 times. And then I think it's five and eight of the next two biggest outcomes. Now that's the probability, but that doesn't mean that's what's going to happen. When we're talking about practice, we're going to give you some rules of thumb that you can apply, just some simple rules to help mitigate risk, to help you understand what risk you're, you're laying on the table. Now, when you 
try to solve a big problem like practice scripting or what you guys, your plan, I think it's really important to have the right people at the table. Okay. And there's a phenomenon called the wisdom of crowds. Okay. So we, we've all heard about big data, right? We're all trying to solve problems with information now in business. Well, people often ask the question, how does data predict the outcome versus people? Well, if you take what's called a linear model and you go one-on-one with a person, the model always wins. However, when you take a group of people and compare that to a model, usually the people win. Here's an example. This is a real example too. There was a consumer product, let's take this printer here, and the, the, the data model said that it was gonna sell 400,000 copies. Then they asked a group of people how many, co- you know, how many, I mean, they thought they were gonna sell 400,000 units. A group of people then were asked how many units of this printer do they think they were gonna sell? And they said maybe 100 to 200,000. And when they asked, you know, the people like, why? They're like, the total quality is this. You can print this many pieces of paper this fast. Somebody in the group said, it's a butt ugly printer. Well, there was no butt ugly variable that they were looking at. The point is, is this. When you get a group of people to look at a problem, things are going to pop up that you never would have thought of. So I think it's critical when you start looking things. Do you have you know, your key staff members there? Do you have diverse opinions in the room? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to develop situational awareness. We're going to break down the problem into its constituents parts so that we can understand how things are connected. Uh, Situational awareness is being able to accurately describe the full scope of the situation. And it is the first step to understanding things. So In any scenario that you go into, the first thing you want to do is develop a high level of situational awareness. So what is practice? To me, I look at all physical or human performance problems through this lens right here. There's a physical, a psychological, a technical, and a tactical component to any sport. doesn't matter what the sport is. So when you practice, you improve skill acquisition your ability to learn and execute skills. You are improving or you are inoculating your athletes to the stress of the game. That's the psychological. And then you're weightlifting on the field. I'm gonna go into that a little bit more. You are actually creating physical, physiological change with how you script your practices. And we're gonna dive into these things right now. So skill acquisition. The problem that you're trying to solve in sport is determining how to solve a motor task. A motor task could be throwing, it could be catching, it could be blocking, it could be tackling, tracking an object in a diverse settings and all sorts of crazy scenarios. That is what the brain is trying to do, is trying to solve problems. We solve the problem by developing an appropriate motor pattern or a sequence of movements arranged in time and space. So if I've got to throw around somebody, I might sidearm the ball versus if I have a clean pocket, you may throw the ball as you see right here. But that's what your brain is literally trying to do. It's trying to figure out a way to obtain the objective. And if you orient yourself around that, it helps you understand how to teach movements better. Now there's stages of learning. The first stage is unconscious incompetence. That's where you don't know that you're doing it wrong. So a guy's on the field, he executed drill, he doesn't even know that he's doing it wrong. Then there's conscious incompetence. That means that the athlete now realizes you show him on film and he goes, oh, I realize that I'm wrong. The next stage you want to take somebody to is conscious competence, where they can think and then they can execute what you're asking them to do. But that requires a lot of energy. What we're trying to move our athletes to is a state of unconscious competence, like flow, where it's just happening. And that takes a lot of repetitions, okay? I started my career in the weight room. First time you teach somebody to do an RDL, it it is painful to watch. They can't, you know, bend their knees and hinge without, you know, their back rounding out. They, you know, then you, I take it, you know, now with the Venom mobile phones that I would like video them like, oh, that, that's what it looks like. Gosh, that's terrible. And then over time, they can just boom, do it. 
Same thing on the field. These are the stages you got to take them through. So how do you do that? It's called motor learning. You need a high quality exposure to the sporting movement, meaning you want them to be in a state where they're rested, they're awake, and they're getting very good quality of exposure. The intensity should not exceed the mechanical efficiency of the athlete. So what's appropriate for a 22-year-old, 21-year-old college player that has a number of years under his belt, he's mechanically efficient, he moves really well, is not appropriate for a sixth grader who may be his first time to play football. You have to scale your drills and in your install, meaning as time goes on, the drill should become more and more and more and more difficult. You shouldn't be doing the same thing that you did day one. Same thing goes in the weight room. I mean, this is where this, all these things are interconnected. You need to introduce skill practice, and it must be in, initiated relative to the skill of the athlete, too. So you have the mechanical efficiency, you have the skill of the athlete. Okay, and those are two different things. And it's not just about a rep, but about the nature of the movement. You know, I've worked under some really great coaches that run like the air raid style offense. Well, I, I have no idea what the intention under how Mummy was. I think he's an amazing coach. He, he's definitely a game changer in the sport. But something that's come out of, of, of these up-tempo offenses is that now that you run plays at a faster clip, that means that everything in practice must occur at a faster clip. Well, that's not true because if everything is going really, 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 really fast, you can't really learn. It's kind of like, like this. If somebody is trying to learn math and the math professor is screaming at them the whole time, it's going to be really, really hard to learn in that type of environment. I'm not great at math. Thank God for Excel and calculators now. But I was one of these kids that, I mean, you wouldn't have learned anything. The same thing goes on the field. There's a time and a place for intensity and stress, and we're going to talk about when that is. But when you're first teaching a skill, you need to remove stress so that the athlete can think, so that you can correct, and so that you can teach. That is what's happening during practice. So how do you introduce a skill or a concept? You start slow. I know it's, it can be frustrating, but if you go too fast, too soon, their acquisition or how quickly they're going to pick it up is not going to be very good. You perform the task in a low stress environment prior to any fatiguing exercise. So if you have the ability to do sports work, like seven on seven, or let's say it's in the summertime, there's a seven on seven deal, the linemen are gonna do this, have them do that before they go lift and condition. Okay, because the body is gonna be too fatigued to execute what you want it to execute well. This is when you're learning something, the most important skills that you wanna teach, teach it to them when they're fresh. Address all learning types. You know, I've heard it said you go from the film to the walkthrough to the field. Some athletes, like they're really good at picking stuff up on a screen. Some, they physically need to walk through it. That's okay, but try to address all different learning types. Perform a large volume of technical work at slower speeds. You can perform a million reps of zone blocking, you know, just stepping, moving to the second level, at slower speeds and really help guys feel the flow of how that's supposed to work. You don't have to do it really, really fast all the time. If they can't do it slow, you can't do it fast. Then you add speed and then you add psychological stress. And there's a, there's a, um, there's a progression to this. Okay. The psychological stress is the last thing that you want to add. That is the most specific to the game situation is the stress of the game. Okay, and we're going to talk about how to do that here in a second. So we're going to build a model now. In strength and conditioning, there are four basic things that you're trying to improve. Speed, strength, power, and what's called work capacity. It is a fundamental tenet of strength and conditioning that you can't improve all of these things at the same time with equal results. Now, if you're a 12-year-old that's never trained in your life, yes, you will see dramatic improvements across the board freshmen that have never trained or lifted weights yeah you'll see big improvements but those things will start tapping out pretty quickly you need to have times and periods of focusing on different abilities so for instance there are certain abilities that pair well speed and power pair well together strength and power pair well together but if you're trying to get a team in unbelievable shape something's going to suffer and usually it's strength 
So you have periods of time or blocks of time you focus on these things. The same thing could be said about football. There's three basic things that you're trying to improve with practice. Your technique or your skill, the tactics, which is when you put all these things together and that's your offensive, defensive philosophy, your model, whatever you're running, whether you're running a 4-3, a 3-4, you're running whatever you are on offense, you have an RPO game, whatever that is. And then you have football IQ. You know, that's like situational football, how you understand the game. It's not, you're not just executing a play anymore. You're thinking about the down, the distance, the situation, where are we on the field? And that takes time and awareness. But these are the three things that you're trying to improve. I think it's really important that you have a model for the year of what you're going to put, you know, what you're going to emphasize. Because if you try to emphasize all these three things equally, you're not going to get better at, at all of them like you want. So maybe in spring football, you're spending more time on the technique, a little bit less on the tactics and the football IQ part, the situation, component. you're like, we can wait on that. If you have the opportunity to engage with your kids in the summer, maybe you're starting to get them to understand the playbook and execute your plays better, lining up, formations, all that kind of stuff. In the preseason, you know, it may look different each week during the preseason as you get closer to the game. The football IQ becomes more and more important. And then the season comes, you're spending a lot more time on the tactics, the football IQ, and you just don't have as much time to practice for just the technical stuff. Now, there is no perfect recipe for this. As a coach, you have to determine all this stuff. But I think it's really important to zoom back and say, where are am I putting my eggs? What is my emphasis? What am I trying to get? We all know that a smarter football team is going to win games when skill is pretty equal. The smarter team that plays more fundamental, that doesn't turn the ball over, is going to win. But you have to have a plan for this. The next thing I'm talking about is uh, stress inoculation or mental toughness. Mental toughness is really only the stress that you have been inoculated to. Let me repeat that. It's not like you can't be tough at everything. It's impossible. Recently, I was invited to the Ununiformed Services University for Health and Sciences. That's a military university in DC. And I got to hear the base, the top and operational psychology present. And he talked about this. Now this guy's worked with tiered units, okay? If you want to be tough at something, you have to train that specific ability, okay? Doing generally difficult things will help you be more confident, but it doesn't make you more tough at what you're trying to do. It's task specific. If you want to be able to execute in the most critical situations in football, you need to put your athletes in those scenarios, and then you need to teach them how to succeed. I'll give you an example. Okay, I was recently talking to an operator uh, in the Army, special operator in the Army, and he asked me how I develop mental toughness. And I said, well, let me, let me give you an example here. Now, let's say you made it through SWIC, you're now a Green Beret, and for some reason you never jumped out of a plane. Okay, so here we are, your first time to jump out of a plane, I'm going to put you to the edge of the plane, or at the edge of the plane and say, jump, you have zero training, what's going to happen? He's like, I'm going to freak out. Of course you are. Why? Because you're X amount of thousand feet from the ground, you never jumped out of a plane before you think you're going to die. However, if I take you to Fort Benning, Georgia, take you to a jump school, Okay, and I start progressing from 10 feet, you're jumping off into a foam pit. And we start bringing it up higher, and eventually they have this huge tower in Fort Benning where there's a parachute attached to it, and they drop it off, and you float down. You do that over and over and over. It's called stress inoculation. Then, after weeks of training, when you have to go do your static line jump, you are ready to go. That is task-specific mental toughness. Nobody is just born willing to jump out of a plane. Just like if you want to develop a tough football player, it happens in practice in the most crucible situations. So how do we inoculate people to stress? The first thing you have to do is you have to build a technical and tactical proficiency. They have to trust their skills. They have to have a high level of confidence in their skills and their ability to do whatever it is you're asking them to do. Running a certain route, checking something off, reading a coverage, et cetera. They have to feel confident in their ability. 
then you have to scale the stress. You have to make it become more and more and more difficult for them to operate. Maybe you constrain the environment. Train them on the boundary of their ability. The only way that you move to a new level is figure out where that edge of their ability is and move them past that. So like, here's an example of what you may do. You could create a scenario where, you don't know, say you're the offensive coordinator, you give the defensive coordinator your plays. Like, this is what we're going to do, and I want you to call the perfect defense for this, where if we don't execute perfectly, we don't succeed. You don't tell the players, okay, but they just have to go out and execute. They may fail. Then when it's over with, you explain to them what just happened and why execution is at a premium. So you can bring them to that edge of their ability and then force them to perform at an elite level. There's nothing wrong with failing as long as you teach them how to overcome that failure. Well, that's the philosophy and rationale behind how you're going to get your team ready for week one. Get them game ready and avoid what Eric called the first week conundrum tomorrow. He's going to go through and detail out and look at exactly how you script that for your team and the numbers that go into that. Very interesting podcast. You're going to want to listen. I think it's something that will help you as you get ready for the 2022 season. There's a link to this one. If you want to see the slides, there's a free coupon in the show notes where you can get this entire talk, the slides that are along with it, at CoachTube. So check that one out. Be sure to get that. Follow all we're doing at CoachAndCoordinator.com and follow me on Twitter at CoachKGrabowski.